I ended up taking seizures. So I was an ambulance. There was 40 minutes working on me outside my mum's house. Thought they'd lost me. It is ruining lives. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely ruining lives. I was lucky that I um, I was just lucky. And there was a lot of hard work in it, didn't, didn't get me wrong. But um, I'm see, I speak to people daily that whose lives are, are just ruined by the baby and the coke. I was talking to a young guy in Pullman who was serving a life sentence for committing a murder that he couldn't remember. And he couldn't remember it because he was drunk. Scotland is beautiful, but it's also got an ugly side, and in this week's episode we're going to look at the broken relationship that Scotland has with alcohol, because for as long as we remember it's been normal for people in Scotland to talk about getting bluttered, getting steaming, and in this past year in particular more and more people have been turning to alcohol as a coping strategy to get through this tough lockdown period. We know this is not normal um, and I'm sure that many people out there will know somebody who's been affected by alcohol and alcohol addiction. But this episode's not all doom and gloom. The Your Evolution's all about finding solutions and sharing positive messages. And in this week's episode, we've got three people who've come forward. They've come through dark times with alcohol and they're here to share their story. And do us a favour guys, if you're enjoying these episodes, please hit the subscribe button. Des O'Hare is a great guy from Balloch that myself and Alan have been friends with for many years. We'd sometimes meet Des out and about in the pubs in Balloch, but Des's social drinking took a dangerous turn and he found himself in a very dark place. And here Des tells his full recovery story publicly for the first time. And he reveals how it got so bad that he almost died in his early 30s. I just drank I, I thought it was normal mm. uh, for a long time. I can remember a couple of my pals seemed to look desperate a couple of nights because off it. But I mean, I remember going, I could go every night after work, two or three beers. And then it got to a stage where you're like, I'm drinking every day. Mm. But I mean, for a long time, my pals, some of my pals would say, yeah, I'm drinking again. You know, but I never drank in the house, so I always thought, it's no problem, I don't drink in the house, I don't have drink in the house. In fact, even my cousins get me stuff for Christmas and stuff like that. I was pal, I'd be good for days. I had pallets of beer in my house for like two years, mm. but I'd rather walk around two minutes to the pub. That's just the way it was, I didn't see it's an issue then. But eventually got a grip of me, eventually. When did you begin to realise that social drinking was beginning to become problem drinking? Well, basically, 
I was fine, you know, I was going to work and I was fine. Uh, but I say I was fine, but eventually, eventually, even at a young age, I remember just my pals getting hangovers and I was gonna get it. Remember they felt the same, I didn't think they felt the same, I felt as if I was just anxiety through the roof. And I thought the only thing somebody says once, try a curer, and then that was it for me. It's like so every time I drank, I thought the next day I'll need a curer. Right, so then the next time, but that cure leads to an extra cure, an extra, and it just no balls. Yeah. But it was really all oh, about the anxiety for me. That that was the thing, and it. I'm, as I say, I functioned for a while, functioned for a good while, on and off. I mean, I worked in pubs and didn't drink when I was working and stuff like that. Aye. I worked other jobs, <laughs> but eventually it did get a grip where I was. As soon as I finished work at night, I was drinking to get to sleep, waking up, rough. And then eventually, eventually, one of the jobs I was at, I was having to travel a few miles, and I couldn't travel with it. Having a, I convinced myself that I couldn't drink, couldn't go with it, having a couple of drinks to just set my nerves to go. So I wrote the camels back. It was a Christmas time. I was working uh, in Drimmon, and I was drinking before I went to work. And I mean, a few things happened through drink. A lot of biggest mistakes in my life have happened with drink. Drinks been involved, stupid mistakes, and genuine mistakes you know and that's not even remembering and that's not an excuse because I'm tell, I can, I tell the world my problems on on Facebook and I, I'm very very open I think that's accountability is huge Aye. you know <clears throat> to take the responsibility for your actions no just blame it and drink as well mm. it was my fault or oh, it was my fault but drink really really made it worse I, mean, just, I don't know just blank blackouts doing things you don't remember doing stuff but I remember going to Drimmon one day and the, the, the boss the was a good friend of mine and I was, I was so nervous about going. It was about Christmas time. I drank a couple of things really quickly before I went, and I walked in and he went like me, "You're drunk. You need to go." And I went like, "Do you want me to go?" And he said, "Aye." And then that was it. I mean, I'd, I'd fucked up another couple of jobs through drinking, but no, actually doing anything drunk at work, but just mm-hmm. being around drunk at the time. Mm-hmm. And I went down the road, and I knew then, I knew then. But that turned. That wasn't even. That was the tip of the iceberg. That turned into. Not leaving the house, they been feared to go out, phoning people, begging them to get me drink. I didn't think I could get go through the day without a drink. Drink to sleep, drink to not me out to sleep. Wake up in the morning, first thing I needed was a drink before I could function. Mm-hmm. We recently interviewed Tom Fox, who serves on the board of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he is also a spokesman for the support organisation. My day job was with the prison service, and I have to tell you that alcohol is probably the single most common feature in offending behaviour in Scotland. Mm. Um, We have a real problem in the west of Scotland with alcohol abuse and chronic alcohol abuse. I'm not suggesting that everybody who chronically abuses alcohol is necessarily an alcoholic. But the problem we have is that particularly in younger heads, alcohol is much more socially acceptable to abuse than anything else yeah. because they see that behaviour in parents and in grandparents. And I don't think that we always realise how serious a problem alcohol abuse is in our country and in particularly the West of our country. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all right to get out of your face. You yeah. know, well, it's not all right. You know, apart from the, the, the dangers of, of alcoholism, um, alcohol abuse causes acute health problems. You know, we've got guys in prison in their 30s living in 70-year-old bodies, and very often it's because of chronic alcohol abuse going on over periods of years. I, I was talking to somebody the other week and describing to them a, 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 a situation that I was in a number of years ago where I was talking to a young guy in Pullman who was serving a life sentence for a, committing a murder that he couldn't remember. And he couldn't remember it because he was drunk. He wasn't on drugs, he was drunk. Kirsty Mokai is a mum who lives in Edinburgh who had a long struggle with alcohol abuse, but she has been alcohol free for over three years now. And Kirsty works as a sobriety coach, helping other people break free from their alcohol addiction. And as well as being absolutely hilarious, 
Kirsty is also the founder of an amazing movement called Sober Buzz Scotland, which is a positive online community where people support each other in staying off the drink. My 20s weren't too bad, but my 30s, I had a lot of trouble in my 30s. Um, I really suddenly lost my mum when I was 33 and there was just a culmination of different things happened then and I was drinking more and more and more. Um, I had a really good job at the time. I worked in the corporate world and um, I used to come home and say that I needed a drink. You know, I deserved a drink. This is what I needed to help me relax and to help me calm down. And sadly, by um, in my thirties, I, I got married and that broke down quite quickly. I'd done IVF, that didn't work. And it was just one thing after another. Um, and by the time I stopped drinking, I, I, I knew when I was 27, I had a problem with alcohol because I knew that I just couldn't stop at one or two you know it was all or nothing when my wee girl was at her dad's I'd go out partying on a Friday and just carry it on right till Sunday night and other folk could be going home on the Saturday or you know t at least taking a break or whatever but I just never knew when to stop so I was 27 then and I finally um, managed to quit for good when I was 41 so that was three years ago um, three years ago just past December but things were bad prior to that I mean I've, I've spoke openly before I had suicide eye dilation so I was wishing myself dead you know I used to think that it would be easier for um, my family if I was dead because I couldn't see a way out of it I just couldn't I would try and stop drinking and I would maybe get two days at the very 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 most and I'd be straight back on it again so I didn't drink in the morning, um, I didn't drink at work, I didn't drink, I, I drank at lunchtime at the weekends, you know, it was like, oh, make a roast dinner, I'll have a glass of wine at quarter to twelve. So it was just, it was almost like the mummy culture, the mummy wine cult culture, it was it was seen in my head as, as being quite normal. It was being normalised in social media, it was being normalised on the telly, being normalised in the press, but now that I do the work that I do, I know that it's not normal at all. Um, so yeah, I finally stopped drinking at the age of 41. And I just went cold turkey. It was the day after a Hearts Hibs game. It was, I think it was an, a, a nil nil draw, I'm a jambo. But I remember it was after that. Um, I'd had, it wasn't in my rock bottom. People often ask, was it the worst? It was, definitely wasn't the worst day of my life. Um, but I knew something had to give. And I just changed my mindset that day. Which sounds dead easy as if uh, that was it. And I changed my mind. But it wasn't like I struggled for maybe about six or seven months. He wanted a drink, battling a drink, terrified what to tell people. The stigma was incredible. I thought I was going to maybe lose my job. I had to take a couple of weeks off because I was suffering so badly through the DTs. Because it was between Christmas and New Year, I couldn't get a doctor's appointment. And when I finally did in the January, he told me I should never have stopped like I did because I probably, you know, I could have died. Clearly I didn't, or I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, <laughs> but at the time, um, the, I managed to find an online site, an online support group, sorry, based in New Zealand and with the work that I was doing on myself so I was doing gratitude every day and I was because on the 27th of December I thought I had nothing to live for but something in me on the 28th said I'm alive I've got my best pal and I've got my, my daughter and um, that's helped that helped me stop drinking I found this support group and every day I would put on like I'm five days sober and these amazing Kiwis would be like you're doing amazing you know just keep at it so that really helped um, and and the doctor tried to give me drugs, the doctor tried to give me a Valium detox. I knew I didn't need that because I was about 12 days sober by then. Um, I had went to AA in my late 20s. Now, I'm not one to at all knock AA because I know many people that AA's worked for, but it wasn't for me in my 20s. Maybe it would have been, I don't know. Um, but I knew that I needed somebody to tell me that I was doing a great job and that everything was going to be okay. And I really knew that I had to start loving myself again because I absolutely hated myself. I used to stand in the shower and say out loud, I hate myself, I'm so embarrassed, you know, it was, my negative self-talk wasn't just up here, I was, I was actually saying it out loud to myself, mm. and I remember reading somewhere, a woman called Louise Hay suggests that you look in the mirror and you tell yourself that you love yourself, so um, that's kind of how I got sober, I got sober by loving myself enough, never to put up with that shit again.
Brona Finlay is a woman from Edinburgh whose mental health suffered big time as a result of drinking, which was a big wake up call for her to quit. Brona is now part of the Sober Buzz movement and she recently celebrated being one year alcohol free. I just felt like I was in a constant sort of state of anxiety um, and stressing about little things and towards the end um, I'd be at home and at the weekends I'd notice that I'd sort of get really sort of ratty and, and stressed out with like my family and I'd, I'd like there was a couple of times I noticed that like I just freaked out for no reason it didn't make any sort of rational sense to me and then I'd get really upset about it and I thought I was just absolutely like I thought I was going crazy um, and I made an appointment to go to the doctor and he said that I had stress um, but I refused to get signed off work because um, the situation that I was in I was only sort of on a temporary contract and I was trying to get a, a permanent contract so I didn't want to get signed off from work with stress because um, I, I thought it would jeopardise my chance of actually getting a permanent job. Um, so I sort of carried on trying to do the best I could and it was just after a really bad night out um, of drinking I went out with my partner and his friends and I didn't really want to go out the night that night but it, like, it never occurred to me to either go and not drink or just to not go. Um, so I ended up going, I got drunk, I don't remember how I got home, um, I, like I don't remember what happened towards the end of the night um, and I sort of, I woke up the next morning and I just had that, like, this dread, absolute anxiety about what did I do, what did I say um, and I was really, really low after that um, and I was really scared, like the thoughts that were going around in my head were, like they scared me. Um, I thought about like I had suicidal thoughts and I just like that's that's not me that's never been me and I, I'd never had those thoughts before and and I sort of I knew if I hadn't been drinking the night before I never would have woke up and I never would have felt like that and I never would have had those thoughts um so yeah like, I knew like that was my point where I knew I have to stop drinking where alcohol is concerned, we've got a bit of a double whammy, if you like. On the one hand, the culture in Scotland particularly is to have a drink. You have a drink for a celebration. You have a drink to relax. You have a drink for the night out. You have a drink because you're feeling rubbish. You have a drink. And that's encouraged. How many adverts do you see for it's gin time, it's gin o'clock, um, or let's get the beers out, let's have it. It's everywhere. And again particularly working in the field that I do, I can't help but see it absolutely everywhere. Even going through a supermarket, you're getting literally channeled down the the alcohol aisle. Now, if you're trying your best to, to refrain and stay away and you're seeing a bargain, you're thinking, well, probably not a bad shout to get that. Now, the minimum pricing has aided that in some way because it's stopped the price of the very cheapest alcohol. Whether that's the complete solution, no, of course it's not. But anything that brings down ultimate numbers in alcohol consumption has got to be a good thing. The other thing to pay attention to, and I think this is a fantastic thing to see in Scotland now, particularly the west of Scotland, is the number of young people taking up alcohol has significantly reduced we're no longer seeing young people, sadly, they're, they're doing other things, but alcohol is no longer the primary uh, the primary cause of misuse at the moment, which I think is interesting. I've seen a good thing with Joe, you know, the Eagles, Joe Walsh, I've seen a video, my pal sent me a video, you know, the Eagles, I mean, you're like, all that kind of stuff, of different types, but uh, he's he done a speech at a meeting thing, and he said, alcohol and drugs tell you a lot of lies. Now, the thing is, Alcohol convinces you that you need it to get through the day, and for me that was that just really resonated with me that I was convinced I couldn't do anything without having mm -hmm. a drink. I couldn't even walk to the shops without having a drink to give me the bravery to go. That's how bad it got. In fact, it even got worse with the fact that I wouldn't even leave my house. As I say, I was phoning people, begging them to bring me a drink, and I was I, for a, I probably for about a year I think I was lucky that I never 
that's like, what that's just why the fans it got. Mm-hmm. It's funny, ain't it? You know, like uh, the mind is, is is at the kind of heart of all that stuff, and you know, if you are, you know, we are drinking and stuff, you you always find a, a reason. If you do it, you know, you will always find a reason. To, oh well, this has happened, so Aye, I deserve a drink. A I've had a bad day, or I've had a really rough day at work. I deserve a drink. I tell you, that's a common thing. By the way, I know, I know, I know, and you don't realise you, you get a thing in your system. You go, I'm the only one. You know, you feel this only. I only feel this. Only me that feels this. I only feel this bad. And I used to see people talking about drinking and go, Ah, but they've fixed themselves. But I couldn't do it. I don't. Nah, I I'm worse than them. I couldn't do it. But I can remember my mum got involved. And I was basically killing myself. My mum got involved. It was a shame my dad. Living with my dad, but dad just didn't know what to do. He was just a bloody. He just didn't know what to do. It was a shame. Uh, but. Thankfully, before he passed, we got a good year together when I wasn't drinking, so it was great. He got to see me fix himself up. Good. But uh, I remember my mum getting involved. She, she, she gave me another chance, you know. Not many people get a first chance. Some people don't get a first chance. Not many people get a second or third chance, Alan, you know. But it was great. Um, I remember well going to my mum, went came to the doctor with me. And it's funny you say about the mind and how it picks things up. <coughs> so the doctor said to me, right, you need to stop this drinking days, but you can't, the drink the level you're drinking at, you can't stop. You can't just stop. So all that here is, I don't need to stop drinking. That's Aye, all I hear. So you get back for the doctor and you go to my mum where the doctor says, I don't need to stop drinking. So say, to detox, to do a detox, you need to see you're drinking, well, maybe drinking 20, I think at least 20 beers a day. So what you do is you, you cut that down. So all I heard was that meeting of the doctor, I don't need to stop. I can still drink. That's all I heard. And that's the only bit that stuck in my mind. Aye. So Aye. you're thinking, the doctor says, I don't need to stop. I remember him saying as well at the very beginning, if you give yourself two or three days a week off at this, you're giving your body a good chance. And that's why we, you only take the bits out, you don't take the bad bits where your liver's gobbed, you're like, you know, if you don't, you're just taking, I've got that wee crumb, I can still drink, still drink. But uh, You feel justified in doing so. Aye, and it, um, I think, I tell you what's great, I'll, if you want to talk about, what do you say about drink rewarding yourself? It was funny, and I, I, it was the last year I worked with, and she said to me, Des, you know, you're doing really well with this drink, how do you feel, do you don't feel... I said, nah, I feel good now, I, said, I totally feel fine. And she's like, you've got, I mean, you've got to think, think about somebody that goes to a slimming club, or, and they have a good week and they lost a pound, they can go home and treat themselves with a bar of chocolate. You I, you can't go home and have a beer because you've had three weeks after drink and you've done well. Mm-hmm. It's just a, it's just a non, it's just non-negotiable, you can't do it. Absolutely. So, we've heard about the, the journey from... Being young, getting to potentially rock bottom. I suppose for people out there, one of the big things about this channel is just about the type of practices that people use to, to get themselves mm-hmm. healthy, to get themselves well. How have you managed to get yourself more balanced? How have you managed to stay away from drink and, and build a more healthier life for yourself? Well, funnily enough, I still go to the pub when we're allowed. Uh, I've got great mates, a couple of them won't drink. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's different, that's not for everybody again. What I would say is, you, I went through the doctor, I detoxed, but it was a it was a detox under supervision. Unfortunately, as I say, we didn't we didn't know how much I was drinking, so we get we started with a start. Say the nurses thought I was drinking sixteen. I think I was at least as I say 20, 25 beers a day, easy, easy. So we tried to tried to bring it down gradually. But unfortunately, I came down too quick because of the numbers. We didn't know the exact numbers. I ended up taking seizures, so. I was an ambulance, there was 40 minutes working on me outside my mum's house, thought they'd lost me. Uh, and I was taken to Paisley, I was in for 10 days. And since then I've never touched a drop. Everybody, understandably, is very nervous about drug and chronic uh, drug abuse, and so they should be. And you've spoken to people who I'm sure have been affected by drug abuse. But alcohol potentially is as, is a, as big a problem. Mm. It's available. It's easily available, it's relatively cheap, and it's acceptable to use it. You know, how many people have you known that are going out, I'm going out and I'm going to get out of my face? You know, people set out to become drunk, not, not to enjoy a drink, but to become drunk. And it's a real problem for our society in the West of Scotland. And it's it's a problem that I don't think we have actually properly faced up to. You know, everybody knows, you know, eh, or it's just alcoholics that have got a problem with alcohol. Well, well, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. And the the, the health damage that's been caused by it and that we've seen in the prison service caused by it is is phenomenal. 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's really important that you are putting out the kind of messages you're putting out about people's well-being and long-term well-being because the damage that alcohol can do to somebody when they're young can linger with them for the rest of their life. Um, and, and people need to be aware of that. It's not just having a blast on a Friday night or a Saturday night. It can become much more serious than that for a lot of people. Um, when I was six months sober, I came out. I was like, I'm sober. And everyone was like, no danger. <laughs> How can you be sober? Because <laughs> I, I told everybody I had an upset stomach and that the doctor had told me to cut out, um, apart from my closest friends. But after I got to six months, I knew I would never drink again. I knew I wouldn't drink again anyway. But like by the time I got to six months, I was so you know, strong in my conviction, I was like, not a chance am I going to do that again. I started clubbing again, I started going to gigs again, um, and I realised that I liked being alive, and I liked being no hungover, and I can't, I'd, I'd done drugs as well, you know, I was a big coke, um, uh, do you know, I took a lot of coke, and, and so I just knew that this life was far better than what I had before, which is crazy, it, like, if you spoke to me three and a half years ago and said you'll be sober and running a sober community and all the rest of it, I'd have been like, give me half a line of what you've got, because I would never have believed it, because this is not like what anybody, I don't think, thought that would, would happen to me, so I, I can go out Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like when we're allowed to go and remember it all, so things like that, you know, actually enjoying nights, so I used to go to, like, I used to go to, um, club nights and to see specific DJs and not remember anything about getting in. Whereas now I've travelled up and down the country. I, I am the oldest there, like at the back, like the CID <laughs> or whatever. But like, I really enjoy it now. So like there's there's that whole buzz about life. Um, I know that I'm in my, my, my 40s. My friend said to me recently I was over middle age, but like I feel younger now than I've ever felt before. Like I, I keep fit, I run. Um, I've just got a real zest for life. But if you're asking how to get to this point or, you know, it's hard, it's really, really tough because there's a huge stigma around not drinking. And um, I sometimes think I've nailed myself to this cross and I don't know if I'll ever get off it because it's now I'm like sober Kirsty. And I, there still is now when I meet new people who, if I've got to say I don't drink, I can see them like, all right, okay, so how do you enjoy it? Like, I'm single and occasionally I, I, I go on the dating sites and folks will say, oh, we could go for a drink. I'm like, right, well, sometimes I put up I'm sober, sometimes I don't. But as soon as I say, oh, I don't drink, you know, people are really are kind of like, all right, okay, so what do you do? Well, I still go to the pub, like, I still go out for dinner, I still go clubbing. There's a huge stigma, and especially, clearly I'm not a man, but especially for men not drinking. So, like, lots of men that come to my page, they're so scared to turn around to their friends and say, I'm not going to drink this weekend because folk are like, see, women bond with vulnerability. So women will be like, I'm the same as you, I was struggling, my, the fear's really bad, I can't do this to the bearings anyway, da, 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 da. Men are like, oh, I'm absolutely fine, Ken, let's get back on it. So there's a huge stigma in this country, in Scotland, um, probably in the UK as well, because Sober Buzz Scotland now has people from all over the world and the country on it. And I think that if you want to stop drinking, you need to confide in somebody that you really trust and support and say, and please just trust me on this, I need to give this a little shot, I need to give it a try. And nothing changes if nothing changes. So if you want to stop smoking, which is probably the hardest thing I've ever tried to do since I stopped drinking, um, was then stopping smoking, you wouldn't have cigarettes in your house. So get all the drink out of your house. Never mind, oh, I'll keep it there in case somebody comes around or for a special occasion. That's not going to work. Um, if you, It's hard at the moment because we're in lockdown, but in the same way, it's really good because we're in lockdown. So you can just see your mates on Zoom because, oh, aye, that's a beer and it could be alcohol free or whatever. Use this time to be like, I'm just going to see what it's like to have a period of time after the baby. Your friends want a, a date when you're when you're getting back on it. So just give yourself a wee bit of leverage at, at the beginning. Oh, I'm going to just stop for three months. Give them a date. I will be drinking again at the end of April. That gives you that sort of breathing space, you know. And see, it's non-negotiable. I am not discussing this for reasons known only to me and maybe your partner or if you've got one or whatever. I'm not doing this and I'm not, you know, I won't be pushed on it. If people are pushing you to have a line of coke or have a drink, I'm sad to see either they've got a problem or they're not really your friend. Once you get further down your journey of sobriety or, or a period of sobriety, you feel more comfortable in questioning that and questioning people's boundaries against you. But at the very beginning, you just need to dig deep and spend time on your own. Write a list of whys. I always say that at the very beginning. Why do you want to stop drinking? In the very beginning, it'll be a lot of negatives because 
I spend too much money. I didn't come home and I'm telling my partner I'm going to come home. I'm no 100% for the bairns, all this stuff. But as you go on, week after week, you'll have all these positives. I don't drink because I went wild swimming. I don't drink because I managed to do a better 5K, 10K. I don't drink because I sleep better. I don't drink because I eat better. So really build up a case study for yourself to, as to why that's what the sort of stuff I used to do as to why you don't drink I still do a gratitude list every single day and every day I write sobriety on it so when I put my sobriety up that like I don't think I'm an alcoholic anymore because I've got no interest in drinking like it's not like oh remember when I stopped drinking right I thought I'll never go to the pub because I'll be like greeting at the gin like oh just what a gin like it's nothing like that you get past the point and you're like I'm desperate to go out so on your gratitude, put sobriety, and then you start to see everything that sobriety has brought you, you know? Like, I've got my own business now. Uh, I go, to, I can travel. Like, I never had any money. Like, I can, I've booked up to go to Bali. Clearly, I can't go. But, like, I've got all these things. I couldn't have done that if I was still drinking. I listened, started listening to podcasts and reading books. I ordered a couple of books um, that really helped me. And I decided to pick a couple of different events that I had coming up that, I didn't really want to go to if I was perfectly honest and but I mean one of them was a wedding so I knew it wasn't really an option not to go so I decided right if I can go and I can do this and I can do this sober then that's a good first step um so I did that I managed that and then I managed a couple more and then I decided actually well I actually feel quite good I can do these things without like having having or needing a drink um, it's not as bad as I thought it might have been um, and it was actually a lot better than I thought it was um, so I then said to myself I'm like right I want to go three months without a drink um, and I said to my family and my friends that like that's what I wanted to do um, but I don't like I don't really think they understood where exactly it was all coming from because um, I don't think I really understood it was quite hard to articulate it at the time when I was going through it and it's only really with the benefit of hindsight of looking back and learning all everything about sort of myself and what I was going through that I'm, I'm able to articulate it now um but initially I struggled with those three months I, I mean I think I managed I think it was sober October I did and I managed that and then there was some sort of celebration and I ended up having to settle with a friend and then I managed another couple of weeks and I managed Christmas sober, um, but then it was a couple of days later that something else happened and I ended up having a drink. And I was just, I got really disappointed in myself because I said, like, I'm going to do this and I didn't do it. Um, and then it was round about that time that I found Sober Buzz. I have actually seen the difference that Alcoholics Anonymous can make in the lives of people. And uh, we talked earlier about alcohol being a really prevalent factor in offending. There's a lot of alcoholics in prison. And AA bring them something that I don't think anybody else can. Hope. I've got a friend in AA. Uh, Bruce won't mind me mentioning him. Um, who was a frequent flyer. You know, he had nearly got a customer loyalty card for the prison service. He spent a very large part of his adolescent and adult life in custody. And AA helped him save himself. He's now a playwright. Uh, he, he's he's now a, a very successful individual. He's, he's had work in the Edinburgh Festival, for example. Um, and if anybody had told me, 20 years ago, that that's where Bruce would be now, I would probably have had you locked up for your own good. <laughs> that's what that's what AA can do for people. It gives them hope because it provides a supportive environment where people who have walked the walk can help you walk that walk. I mean, it's AA doesn't save people. People save themselves, but AA creates the environment where that self salvation is possible and and it's it's it is self help but it's it's recognizing that you know there's something bigger than just us and and what i've said um about AA, as an outsider and i'm not an alcoholic and 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 but i'm i'm privileged to work with AA. um it's the only place that i have seen people offering un 
unconditional love and support to strangers because they've walked the same walk. Now, I think probably the same is true of Narcotics Anonymous. I've, I've, I've worked with them too, but to a much lesser extent. And it's about meeting an environment where people have belief that you can actually turn your life round about. And because people have that belief, because people offer that support, then it performs something nigh on a miracle for a lot of people. Um, and I, the other thing about AA that's been very obvious during the, 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 the current pandemic is service is a key part of recovery. Providing support and help to others is a key part of the recovery of, 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 of alcoholics. Now, that service can vary from, to, you know, doing things like this to making the tea to organising the venue. There's all sorts of different kinds of service that people provide. But providing service as a way to support others is a fundamental part of recovery. And it works. You know, the guys, the guys who dreamt this up in America, Bill W and, and, and his partner, you know, they were clever guys. <laughs> you, they saw that, you know, it's not about, um, it's not about lecturing people, it's not about trying to convince them, it's about being there for them. And one of the things which has been staggering during this pandemic is a year ago, there were probably very few, if any, AA meetings in Great Britain that were online. Uh, they were all physical meetings in church halls and YMCAs and the like up and down the country two or three thousand meetings a week. In the course of a few weeks, we were able to offer meetings online across the whole of the UK and, and, and English-speaking Europe. I was lucky, very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just knew then, when I went into the hospital, they said to me, mum said to, said to my mum, how old's your son? She said, 35, 34. And they said, mum's like, he's 50, you know? Like, he's got to be 50 that boy so we ended up luckily enough got a good consultant get home, mum, stayed with my mum for a year but what about, she wanted to go on about how I get better I just had to strip it back and know that how many much I wanted a drink I just had to think back to how bad I felt the last year I was drinking I was miserable Aye. I hated it, Of course. I hated it I didn't drink for enjoyment then, whereas I used to love it I loved it, but the last year was miserable so if I got these panic attacks which I used to fix for drinking I used to just try and think in my mind look that's going to be a thousand times worse tomorrow if you start drinking again mm -hmm. and then from there from my help my mum and my family and my friends I just built up I thought we need to start getting the legs moving I couldn't walk the length of my room uh, and I started going wee walks and that has turned into the best thing I ever did but having this place near your doorstep of course. Uh, I, I started walking, I walk a route three times a week, I built it up now, eh? Eh, and eh, it's going back to that agoraphobic stage when I was younger, I still get that, but I force myself out now, and see, i tell you this as well, I force myself out and I've never, I never ever regret it, and it came from my boss as well, he said to me, Des, I always like to go around. run, sometimes I force myself out to go, do you know something, I've never regretted going around. run, when I get back in I feel good, so and I feel better. Aye, and he's great, he's been great. He's been great to me as well. It's been great having somebody that's kind of motivates you a wee bit as well. So having your family around you, family and friends help me. But being able to being able to get out walking, get keep your legs moving, keep fit. What, that's what, definitely helped. Definitely. What What would you say to somebody out there right now? You know, maybe who's who's in who's in the situation you were in those, a few well, years ago. Unfortunately, what would your advice be? Unfortunately, a lot of people that you know need help. They don't realise themselves or they don't want to admit it. Change is frightening. It's the most scary thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was so scared to stop drinking. So scared to stop drinking. But if you think about it, the, scare, the, 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 the effects are no changing are scarier. I mean, I wouldn't be here. You yeah, know no. what I mean? I wouldn't be here. But what I would say is, you need to ask for help. You've got to ask. And unfortunately, I know people that drink, and I've got great friends that still drink, who people say, can you help them stop? But it's got to come through within as well. So the first six months, I'm not going to lie, it's a, it's the hardest project you're ever going to work on. 
but I would swear I would give you your money back if I was charging you. Uh, that that it will be the best decision you've ever ever made. So I've got Sober Buzz over here, which is my sober community, and I do my work over here. And the people that I work with aren't people that need to be in recovery, like what I probably should have been, but it's people that need to totally change their lifestyle. So women come to me in their 30s and they're like, I'm still caning it like I was 25. This is new on, but I can't say no when my pals come around for a baby. I can't say no when my man's like, like the many folk that come to me and they're like, oh, we've just been can just get a few drinks and then before we can it we've got a couple of bags of coke in and I remember all that you know what I mean and it's this vicious cycle so mostly it's people who realize that they're just being peer pressured a lot of the time into it so that's my paid work and I work with I work with people that don't have drink problems as well but I, I work with people who want to readdress their 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 relationship to alcohol but over here in sober buzz um, which is voluntary and I don't I don't get paid for which is totally cool but um, I'm speaking to people daily I'm speaking to people you know so many people during lockdown and um, I have to be very careful what I'm saying but I mean I spoke to a lady who was almost 70 last week who was so scared to go out all she's been doing is drinking a bottle of wine because she's like terrified of what she's seen on the news I'm speaking to mums who are known that they'll just have to have a bevy to try and help them keep going um, people who are terrified, single mums who are terrified their kids are going to get taken off them because they're drinking more than what they believe or, or what is um, the, the classified amount of alcohol. Um, people are who were, who were recovering alcoholics who then just got so stressed when we went into lockdown have started drinking again because AA went online, not AA's fault because they were forced into that. Some people live with people who don't know they're alcoholics. So then they were having to think, how am I going to get an online meeting when there's folk in this who's Denny Ken, I'm an alcoholic, you know, hearing all that. So the stuff I do in my work, I'm, I'm not in any way saying that's not hard for the people that I work with, but the stuff that I do in Sober Buzz Scotland, you wouldn't believe like what people are, are actually dealing with. Um, Boris Johnson, and I'll try, not keep, I'll try to keep pol politics out of it, but he came out and said that off-licenses were essential shops. Um, now, there's an argument that people who are alcohol dependent need mm -hmm. um, alcohol, but there's other ways to get alcohol to them. If we're saying, you know, that the, that the gyms are not essential, that, you know, um, I don't know what else, you know, other, other like swimming pools and all that aren't essential but but off licenses are yet we've got one of the worst mental health records in Europe like especially with young men killing themselves because they're either in debt with the gear and debt um, with Betty whatever and we're like off licenses are essential you know you can go and get your get your peeve in when they lifted the 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 lockdown I think they said you know go and have a drink you know is the, it, there doesn't I don't think people realize how dangerous that is if you're in your head oh but I shouldn't drink I shouldn't drink everybody else is doing it so I'm just going to go and have one um, so I sober buzz stuff is really, really important to me. And prior to lockdown, I was speaking to the government about how we need to address, um, like I call it the elephant in the country, you know, this huge problem that we've got with alcohol. I never thought this is who I would become, right? Okay, like, I, like I'm telling you this and I'm like, yes, who am I? But I have kind of taken it upon myself um, to, to try and fight the good fight because it is ruining lives. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely ruining lives. I was lucky that I... Um, I was just lucky and there was a lot of hard work in it, didn't, didn't get me wrong, but um, I'm see, I speak to people daily that whose lives are, are just ruined by the baby and the coke. I felt so much better um, and it, it, it coincided as well with lockdown, so I knew like it was hard not drinking, but I knew doing lockdown whilst I was drinking would have just been so much worse and a lot harder for me. Um, so I yeah I've decided to to stay off it and I think it's just it's like it's made such a difference I feel so much more better about myself like I've got self more self confidence than I than I ever had before and I'm a lot more consistent with my exercising and I feel more confident like in my capabilities at work as well um and so it's just and I think as well I'm amazed that it never really occurred to me that alcohol was the thing that was holding me back um, and that there's another way so I think yeah it's just it's 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 been amazing it's been life changing at the start I think it was just sort of taking one day at a time and making sure I wouldn't drink and then as I felt a bit more confident I started building a like an early morning routine so I make sure that like when I get up in the morning I get up and I get out um, so I either go for a walk or I go for a run um, or I do something outdoors just so that I feel better 
um, sometimes I listen to music and sometimes like I listen to a podcast, um, whether it's a sobriety podcast or um, a, a fiction book on Audible, just something so that um, I've got a bit of me time. Um, I've started meditating as well. Um, and initially I just started doing uh, guided meditations from apps that you can get online like Calm and Insight Timer and stuff like that. Um, but recently I've started extending that to, to longer periods of meditation and, and that makes a big difference. Um, I think as well, like it sounds quite cheesy, but put yourself first. So um, part of the whole journey for me was what, before I said it, it never it never occurred to me not to go to something or it never occurred to me not to do something. So now I really think about, well, do I want to do this? Yes or no. Why do I want to do it? Why do I not want to do it? Um, and if I don't want to do something, then I won't do it. Um, or and I'll I'll make sure I've, I've I've thought about it. But like my immediate reaction isn't just no, but um, it's do what feels right for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's maybe something that people aren't used to doing. Um, yeah, it can be hard to put yourself first, but I think that's that is the key thing that you have to do. This is my second sober Christmas. Last year was my first one, um, and. I I completely changed my Christmas last year, to be perfectly honest. Um, and my family can be quite big drinkers. And I think the year before that, um, I said, well, let's try and not drink as much. And that didn't really happen. Um, so I'm, last year, I decided to spend Christmas with my partner and his family. Um, I just thought it would be easier for me in the long run to just sort of change everything so I didn't have the same like routines and traditions that we were doing so I wouldn't necessarily miss the booze um and then I had it's yeah I had alcohol free alternatives um so I quite like those I think they're really helpful you feel like you're not necessarily missing out um and some of the ones that are out there are um they're quite grown up I was quite surprised I think they've got more flavour in them than you thought and they're better than soft drinks but I know alcohol free alternatives are a bit controversial and, and they're not for everybody um, but I personally really enjoy them and I find them really helpful um, but yeah Christmas was a lot easier this year because I, I'd already done it I think once you've got one thing under your belt um, you know you can do it again. So- well in your area for example you've got DACA yeah. the Bartonshire Area Council of Alcohol they can help and so in, in your area, particularly in Glasgow, obviously you've got uh, the GCA. The first thing I would say is to anyone that's struggling, reach out because that first step makes all the difference. As soon as you acknowledge there's something that you're not happy about, even if nothing changes in that first call, but you make that first call, you've already started in that road. You've already made a bit of your head has made that decision. I need to do something about this. That's your biggest win. There's other steps you can do as well, more practical steps if you're you're not ready to come forward. But even doing something as easy as a drinks diary, somebody can keep that relatively private to themselves. And the truth is about being honest with yourself. So if you are drinking X, Y, Z per day, if you can, number one, if you can acknowledge that you've drank that today or even the next day you recognise, you know, I drank a bottle of this or I drank this or I did that, keep a note of it. And what would be really useful as well is what, what was the trigger? Was there something that happened before you started that, that made you feel you needed that? Um, and is, is that what got? And I think a drinks diary is a really useful way of just saying, well, this week I drank that. Then you look at, well, so next week, I'm going to meet that again. I'm not going to go any further than that. There's your first step, what we call harm reduction. Mm -hmm. So rather than allowing it to keep escalating, as it will, you're putting a line in and you're saying, right, okay, I'm not saying I'm quitting. I'm just saying I'm going to control what's happening at the moment and I'm I'm in charge. I think giving people that power, making the individual feel that they're in charge, it's their decision. They will achieve this. There will be bumps in the way and that's what, places like ourselves in the GCA, we're here to help individuals with that. But everybody needs a wee bit of help, but you need to understand what it is you're needing help with. And so if you can monitor what your alcohol intake is 
and keep it at a level that's sustainable for you or even recognise what's a trigger event, what's something that's going to maybe make you feel the need to have more alcohol that day? What can you put in place to not go? For example, you might have been going to a friend's and it was a friend that you know particularly renowned for going out drinking with. Swap the event, meet them during the day for something, don't go the night event because you know yourself what's going to happen if you do that. Or if you are going out with them, arrange for yourself to come home at a certain time so that you're not going to just stay out all night. If you're drinking in the house on your own, make sure that you're safe, make sure that you're not leaving yourself vulnerable to other issues like uh, cigarettes or, or gas or anything in the house. So you just make sure that you're limiting what you're taking in a day and keeping control of that as you go. I think those steps make a big difference. And fundamentally, you can phone in for support and remain anonymous. You can be supported without having to give all your details. So I think that's important that people know that, that it's private and confidential. It's up to you and it's a private relationship you have. We've seen a, a very significant rise in people contacting AA online or on the telephone during this pandemic. You would expect that. Um, and we've been able to respond to that through the efforts of the members of the fellowship who man these phone numbers, uh, who provide, who staff the, 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 um, the, the, the um, email service and the like. But I think it's very important that people realise that if they reach out to AA, AA will be there. And the people who are there who are people who have walked the same path and will be able to offer understanding, support and fellowship. And we're there all the time. What kind of message have you got for someone who may be struggling right now with the lockdown and, and they're struggling to stay sober and they think there aren't services out there for them because everything's shut down? We're here. Um, we're at the end of the phone. We're at the end of an email. Um, if you send an email, it's revealed people that are dealing with it. There is a there is a chat service on our website. Which, if you go into the website, which is alcoholicsanonymous. dot uh, org. dot uk, the the chat service pops up, um, and you can you can chat to somebody about your problem and. That support is always there. You can contact us through aainformation at gsogb.org.uk. All of these details are on the website. The only requirement to be a member of AA is a desire to stop drinking. Now, if people recognise that they've got a problem and they want to stop, then the fellowship is here to support them through that period. We've got people who have been sober for 50 odd years. We've got people who've been sober for a few weeks. You know, um, during the current pandemic, have some people fallen off the wagon? Yes, undoubtedly. The pressures that have been put on people, there have been some people have fallen by the wayside. I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm aware, but some of the people who've fallen by the wayside have already come back. And we hope that some of the, the others will come back soon. We recognise the pressure that people are under, but they shouldn't feel alone. That's what AA is for, so that people struggling with alcoholism don't feel alone. Um, it's amazing to hear all the, the fantastic ways that you've changed and adapted to the circumstance. And I'm sure that anybody else out there who might who, who's going to be watching this, uh, listening in, uh, couldn't help but be moved by the the powerful words and the powerful actions of uh, of of the AA during during the last ten months, and it sounds like you know you guys are here to stay in support, and I think that will be a comfort to people out there who might be struggling right now with problems around alcohol. So, from Mark and myself, I just want to say a big thanks. We don't have, don't have anything else yeah. to add. Keep up the amazing work. It's been great to speak to. You. Well, I'm just basking in the reflected glory of others. The people who have done this are alcoholics, the length and breadth of uh, Great Britain and English speaking uh, Europe, who have put their money in their hearts where their mouths are mm -hmm. to offer that support to people who are suffering the same terrible illness that they've suffered from. And I'm I'm, I, I am so proud to be associated with this, 
but the, the, the thanks should go to the members up and down the country who made this possible. Yeah. Like I was doing um, sober meetups in Glasgow and Edinburgh and like I couldn't believe that folk were coming along to them. The thing was, you didn't have to say why you weren't drinking. We would maybe get somebody to stand up and talk. Quite often I would get up and talk and tell about, about my story because it's that mental. And then everybody would just sit down and have something to eat. But more and more people were starting to make friendships through it. And we would see people meeting up like online and they would be like, oh, we met up at Sober Buzz. Um, I do Zoom calls at the moment. I've got one tonight. I do a um, couple of Zoom calls a week where MD can jump on and just tell me how they are. I tend to as you can tell, I like to talk. I can talk quite well. So <laughs> well away, and then everybody just says how they're doing, if they've got a problem, and we kind of share it amongst the group. I try and post daily um, a little bit of inspiration, um, especially during dry January. Um, and it's just kind of like, like I, I, there's no organized, like that, that sounds terrible, but it's not like I'm, I, I'm one of these masterminds. I'm just like in the morning, ah, oh, that'll do, I'll pop that up. And then sometimes I'm like, oh my God, 300 people have liked that. And then other times two people like it, but <laughs> it's just kind of snowballed. Um, but I love it. I absolutely love my Sober Buzz um, page. And I didn't see it as like, in, like, like they're my followers. I just see it as all being just my pals really which like that makes me sound a bit crazy but because I have got real life pals but I, I just really really enjoy helping and and they've helped me during this lockdown to be honest know that I thought I would drink but I found lockdown quite difficult because I'm I'm an extrovert and I like to be out and meeting people so it's been good for me as well. It was nearly four years ago that Des O'Hare almost died through alcoholism. He decided to quit drinking on March 27th 2017 and he's not touched a drop of alcohol since then. And just like Kirsty Ann Brona, Des has become a big advocate of the alcohol-free life, and he's also been giving friendly advice to people in Western Bartonshire who are also trying to quit drinking. Des openly talks about his journey on his social media pages, and he invites anyone struggling to stay sober to drop him a message. If you're ready and you deserve to, you deserve to make a better story for yourself in life. You, your story doesn't need to end. I mean, how would I have been? I'm not going to be a massive superstar in life, but, uh, or a celebrity or anything like shit, but you deserve. If there's a hair story that ended in that carpet three years ago, been a drunken mess, it would have been a bad ending. And I think everybody deserves. We can't control everything in life, right? But what we can do is give yourselves a chance of making a right good story while we're here. And infect and affect people the, way, the best we can. And I think we need to be honest with my drinking problem. I love to help other people out. And I, what I would say is, what you need to do is you need to reach out. You need to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Don't be ashamed. People to judge, see judgmental people. I hate that. Everybody's got issues. And see, yeah. as soon as you can't get it comes with age, you realise that. <coughs> and you can support it in people as well. Honestly, ask for help. Go to a doctor, but get guidance through your doctor. And there's support there. Support there, honestly. And you. Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing this years ago, running 10Ks and still got my mental issues, but there's other ways to tackle them. And that's, if you live where we live as well, we're so lucky. Get out there and just, you know, ask for help. Ask. Mm -hmm. But I like to share because I like, when you've been at Rock Bottom Island, you don't want to see anybody else being there. Sit.